At last, let's preview pitching. Welcome into Fantasy Baseball today on Tuesday, February 21st. Frank Sample joined by Scott White and Chris Towers. Today on the show, starting pitcher preview part one. We're going to talk strategy, some game theory, the new rules, how that might change pitching, all that fun stuff, and the top 20 or so in ADP. Just a heads up that I'm about to talk for quite a while, and then I'll give you guys a chance to react. I just kind of want to set the stage for everyone and try and figure out where is pitching going this season. So I think before we can figure out where it's going, what the future is, we have to know where it's been. So last season, the league-wide ERA was 3.97, the first time under four since 2015. It was the lowest league-wide ERA since 2015. Makes sense. Last season, the league-wide whip, was 1.27, the lowest it's been since 1972. All of this with a five-year low in strikeout rate. So how did pitching get better? Of course, the home run rate was the lowest it's been since 2015. Goodbye, juice ball, or at least we think, hopefully. This year, new rules are coming into play. We've got shift restrictions, limited pickoff attempts, larger bases, all which should help promote organic offense, or at least what MLB wants to be offense, more hits, player stealing bases, etc. We did an entire podcast on the rule changes back on January 11th. Feel free to go back and listen if you missed it. Uh, we also talked about that recently on a few of our mailbag podcasts. Now, before we can figure out our pitching strategy this season, I think it's important. We'll start with you here, Scotty. To make an educated guess on what the offensive environment will look like this year. Of course, Major League Baseball can change the ball without telling us, which I really hope that they don't, don't do. But what is your best guess? Is offense coming up from last season, but not nearly as much as 2019 through 2021? And if offense is up, where does it come from and, and which pitchers might be affected? Let's start with that. Scotty, you're up. So I think it is going to continue down the path it started on last year. I think it was by design. I think the rule changes they're incorporating this year are are along the same lines of returning the game to a more traditional tempo and aesthetic and not making it so dramatically three true outcomes with uh, home runs, strikeouts, and walks, and you know not a lot of action on the baseball paths in between they've been pretty consistent about saying this is their goal for the last few years i don't know that they've always implemented it with the dedication or the consistency uh really really that's what i think like some of the frustrations we've had with them over the years like old balls interspersed with new balls i think more that's just um I, I think it's just human error. I don't think it's so much their never know, shady attribute, goings on. Never attribute to malice what can be adequately explained by incompetence, I believe exactly. is the, uh, that, the way you would phrase it. That is that is exactly what I was trying to think of and wasn't coming to me. So thank you for that. Uh so yeah, I think this is I think this is all by design. And I think Phase one was basically last year with the unjuicing of the ball. Phase two is going to be this year with the increase in stolen bases. And while I wouldn't bet my life on it, uh, I, I think this is a new reality that we were going to have to get used to. And I think in the end, we're going to prefer it to the, to, to the way the game was trending during the juice ball era. But it is definitely an adjustment. Chris, questions that we keep receiving just – from a macro perspective, talking about starting pitchers this year are could right-handed starters who pitch more to contact be affected by the improvements for left-handed batters, right? If there's shift restrictions, we assume lefties who hit line drives or ground balls and pull the ball a lot, they could wind up with more hits and so on. That should obviously hurt right-handed pitchers. Um, should we prioritize with pitchers even more? Obviously, those are usually the best pitchers, but is that something that you're worried about even more than ever before? And lastly, Dodgers pitchers, like they've routinely been in the top two in BABIP as a team each of the past four seasons. So I'm throwing a lot your way, but any thoughts on those three questions that seems like we've been getting some form of that question very often this offseason? Specifically with re regards to the Dodgers, I do think that it's fair to assume that they won't be quite an outlier in terms of turning batted balls into outs, but it's not just because of the shift ban. I think they are a very smart team who are going to figure out a way to efficiently turn batted balls into outs relative to their talent level. 
But I think this year their defensive talent level is probably a little worse than it has been, especially at the up the middle positions. And so I do think it's reasonable to think that the Los Angeles Dodgers pitchers, you know, they've, they've obviously Julio Arias has been a very, very good pitcher despite not being an elite strikeout guy. He's also great at limiting quality of contact. So that helps. I, I could see him being a little worse. I could see, you know, fewer of the Tyler Anderson types coming out of nowhere and being very, very good for them. But I'm not particularly concerned about it. I'm not really concerned. I, I think these rule changes are likely to help or impact individual batters much more than they are individual pitchers or pitchers as a whole. And I, I, we've talked about it a few times, but I think the best way to think about it is the, the effects of the shift ban are most likely going to be felt most acutely by guys like Corey Seager, Joey Gallo, uh, guys who are left-handed primarily, hit a lot of ground balls or a lot of line drives uh, as well to the pull side. And the thing about that is, Every single one of Joey Gallo's plate appearances comes as Joey Gallo. Pitchers only face some minimal portion of their plate appearances against that type of hitter. And so it's a relative, it, the way I view it is it, it could be a fairly significant, significant impact on a relatively small number of players, which is going to impact those guys a lot. And the league as a whole, probably not that much. I think we'll see, Fewer outs on batted balls. I think we will see, you know, potentially more strikeouts if there's no penalty for swinging for the fences and trying to pull everything. Like that's one of the potential unintended consequences. But I think on the whole, the the impact of this is probably going to be relatively small on a population level. It'll impact in certain pitchers, but like I am not downgrading Sandy Alcantara very much. And, you know, I know you've mentioned him a few times as a guy who could be impacted by this, but one, he's just really good at turning ground balls into outs, or he's really good at creating ground balls that are batted balls that turn into outs. And, you know, maybe he'll be slightly less efficient than that. I think generally speaking, you should expect regression from, from him from last year anyway, but I don't really expect to see like, a three, five ERA out of Sandy Alcantara. You know, I still think he's going to be one of the best pitchers in baseball. Um, so I'm not too worried about it for pitchers. And then you have like Blake Snell probably won't have any impact because he's barely going to face any lefties. I mean, last year, I think he had like 15 or 20% of his plate appearances against were by, were by left-handed hitters. So, you know, it's, it's possible, but it's not something I think you should account for too much in your draft strategy. I, I agree. And I would also some of my thinking along those lines as far as pitch to contact pitchers go, which, you know, a pitch to contact pitcher these days is like 8K per nine. Yeah. You know, it's still from a historical perspective, it's still a lot of Ks. But if we're thinking of that in terms of a pitch to contact hitter, the dejuicing of the ball helps contact pitchers a lot more mm -hmm. than the shift ban is going to hurt contact pitchers so stock up for contact pitchers and that's a big reason why starting pitching as a whole feels that much deeper scott i know all offseason a hot topic has been position scarcity right and i think obviously that kind of leads itself into how you're going to draft starting pitching this season as well because as we've talked about you can't have everything early on in drafts if you want an outfielder if you want third base if you want second base that means more often than not, you're probably not drafting a starting pitcher until the fourth round at the earliest. And it sounds like this season you might be waiting even longer than that. So what is your general start, starting pitcher strategy for this season? Gosh, I feel like I am I am swinging from one direction to another and just join, join the club. going with as extreme of a strategy as I possibly can every year. And I'm starting to sound like a kook because of it. But uh so my general strategy this year, kind of kind of just for all drafts, as, as we've talked about throughout these um, position preview podcasts, is that what we call them? Position preview podcasts? Sure, yeah. Okay. So uh, ideally, I'm, I'm planning to go outfield in round one, third base in round two, second base in round three, right? 
But then what happens after that? Well, in theory, I could consider taking a starting pitcher as early as round four. And a lot of times my number one pitcher, at least in five by five scoring, Justin Verlander, is still there in round four. So that that's something I could think about doing. And I've done before. But the more I draft, when it's all over and I'm looking at my team and I'm looking about what I did and opportunities I missed, the more that happens, the more I think, I really wish I had more hitters. My pitching feels pretty good. And I pretty much always come out of it thinking my pitching is pretty good. Because the mid-tier at starting pitcher is so deep now. So... I haven't tried it yet, and so I'm a little reluctant to come forward with it in, in the starting pitcher preview that, you know, we're not going to have a chance to redo, and people are going to listen to it more than anything else. But pretty soon in a mock draft, I want to try maybe drafting nothing but hitters for seven or eight rounds. I mean, when I first started doing this 15-plus years ago, that was kind of my thing then too and it worked out pretty well i was more consistent in fantasy baseball in those days than i am now i would say and a part of it's because i think the industry as a whole has gotten so much smarter the competition much stiffer but i think part of it is because it is scarcer than pitching that's just the right way to go up to, to do i mean you know we've we've always said that pitching is more uh, uh, susceptible to injuries and and just fluke of occurrences than hitting is too. When the league, you know, when the ball is normal and and all the input variables for baseball are normal, pitching is much riskier and therefore not not as worth an early investment, and also much easier to find on the waiver wire. So I, I might go with a strategy that extreme, particularly 15 teamer that can get a little dicey because eventually the depth at starting pitcher runs out. Uh, so I don't know that I'm going to wait seven or eight rounds to take my first one in a 15 teamer, but 12 teams are shallower. I might I'm at least going to look into it. I think Frank's having some computer issues. I guess so. Finally, yeah, Frank's been felled by it after you and I have struggled with it. I'll just, you know, kind of pick up where you're leaving off. And I, I don't think my pitcher strategy is going to change too much. I try to be pretty consistent with it year over year. And I think the, the way I've approached starting pitcher the past few years has actually helped me uh, quite a bit. If anything, I've, I've been, uh, yeah, just Frank's Frank's freezing up. Oh, we got two Franks. Am I back? At, In the video it's, it's, stream. It's, this is amazing. Is there really? You'll love to see it. Can you uh, hear me? Move, yeah. Yeah, you're here. Oh, all right, cool. Uh, I don't know where everyone left off. Sorry about that. I don't know what's going on. Hopefully, this doesn't continue to be an issue because, frankly, this is a uh, pretty important podcast. But I know, Scott, last I heard, at least, is you were kind of wrapping up your discussion on strategy conversation. And at least for me, more than ever before, I'm just really picking my spots on which pitchers I want. It's not just, okay, whoever falls to me at this point. It's like, I look for pockets in the draft where I don't really like the hitters that are available. And then I'll find a pitcher I really like there and, and try and pounce on that. At least that's been my strategy early on here, but it hasn't been until like the, at the third or fourth round at earliest, at least for me um, this season in fantasy baseball drafts, Chris, I'm going to come to you here. And, and another, I think topic of conversation I've seen this off season is that, Pitching seems like it's going later in drafts mm -hmm. this year than ever before. So why is that? And some things that I've come up with is that more drafters are emphasizing elite hitters or at least hitting early on, like basically what Scott is alluding to. And the top 15 or 20 feel more interchangeable than ever before. Like Scott, you're going a little far with this ever before talk, <laughs> Frank. They feel more interchangeable than they have in seven years. Well, that's that's about as long as I've been analyzing fantasy baseball. Okay. So, okay, uh, as long as it has been for me, but yeah, I mean, we're getting okay. back to a, a point where fantasy baseball was very different. So, uh, yeah. but but I, I think that's only I think that's only true to a point, right? Like, part of that is that if you go through the top twelve starting pitchers, you've got 
Justin Verlander, who threw 175 innings last season. Max Scherzer, who threw 145 last season. Brandon Woodruff, 153. Jacob deGrom, 64. Shane McClanahan, 166. Carlos Rodon, 178. Zach Wheeler, 153, et cetera, all the way down the line. And so it, it's a question of, are the elite starting pitchers, the, the elite ratio guys at least, are those guys just not going to throw 200 innings anymore? If so, then that means that, one, the guys who do throw 200 innings are going to be super, super valid because you're not just getting more volume, but they're the the ERA and whip that you get from someone like Corbin Burns over the course of 200 innings is just more valuable than what you get from Shane McClanahan over 166, even if Shane McClanahan's awesome. And so it's a question of how should you value the, the rare guys who can consistently throw deep into games and rack up big inning totals, you know, not just the, the elite of the elites, but Aaron Nola. You know, is Aaron Nola potentially undervalued? He's not going to give you elite ratios, and maybe that's, you know, because he gives you more innings, maybe that's a little uh, a little concerning. But, like, I don't know. I, I think it might be more important to get a 200-inning starting pitcher to anchor your staff now than it has been well, because there are so few guys who can do that. Well, what do you even mean by elite ratios? Because Aaron Nola last year had a 0 0.96 whip. He had. Right. His ERA is usually a little higher, I guess. Uh, 3.25 last year, um, 3.97 or whatever it was the year before. So I guess that's that's more what I'm referencing. But that kind of proves okay. my point. It's like maybe Aaron Nola is just like he's usually around SP10, SP12, probably maybe a little later. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe that's just like maybe we're just not valuing that enough right now. Maybe the fact that he's going behind your Shane McClanahan's and, and Spencer Strider's like, Maybe that's what we need to be valuing more. Maybe it's easier than ever to find quality pitchers, but it's really, really hard to find quantity. And maybe that's like, maybe I, I've been a, a proponent of the, you know, we'll call it hero SP strategy where you get one of those anchors. Uh, typically I'm aiming for someone who can give me 200 innings or can reasonably project for 200 innings. And I do include someone like Max Scherzer who hasn't gotten there in a couple of years, but I don't think it 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 mostly just takes avoiding things going wrong for Max Scherzer to get there. Whereas, like, I don't think Spencer Strider can get to 200 innings. I just I, I don't think there's a path to Spencer Strider throwing 200 innings. And and maybe he's good enough that it doesn't really matter. But like, I want someone who can fairly easily handle that kind of workload to anchor my staff. And then I'm kind of with you guys after I've got that guy in the second or third round. I'm probably not going to draft one for seven or eight rounds. And, and that's because historically outside of the first four or so rounds, starting pitchers tend to be pretty bad investments guys who we get excited about the potential. We get excited about what they've shown in small sample size. They tend to get pushed into that like eighth to 10th round range. Those guys tend to be pretty bad bets, or at least they tend to not be much better bets than the guys who are available in 12 through 15. And so I think, you know, the ideal way for me to build my pitching staff is probably to have one, you know, Corbin Burns or Garrett Cole would be great. Aaron Nola, Sandy Alcantara, Max Scherzer, those type of guys at the top. And then backfill with, you know, the that wide middle class that we talk about. So what if if if, if I am going the more extreme route, and, and maybe it's smart to grab one good pitcher in there, maybe round four, Justin Verlander would be a great idea. But if I go the more extreme route, I think if we're talking, you know, from a five by five roto perspective, the biggest concern I would have is strikeouts, because that your your problem you you in that big middle class of starting pitching, you can probably get either volume, you you can find either volume or terrific ratios. You can find volume from like a Merrill Kelly. You can find the ratios from like a Jeffrey Springer, but you're probably not going to get both in the same package unless it's a huge breakout. And, you know, you, you got to get kind of lucky to, to land on those. So um, it might be worth it. The key, it might be worth it to take one kind of a hero SP as you're talking about. But if you're going to do that, it would have to be a big strikeout guy. I don't know. Maybe even like a Dylan Cease, who I personally 
have some concerns about, but one of those concerns isn't strikeouts. Like I know he's going to give me a ton of those provided he stays healthy. Uh, to frame this another way though, to, to put it more from a points league perspective, to give you an idea of how much deeper the starting pitcher crop is uh, even just from 2021. So the number of pitchers who scored 13 plus fantasy points per game last year was 51. In 2021, it was 35, increase of 16, 13 plus points per game. And, and, you know, that there's an increase regardless of where you put that threshold. If you go 17 or let's say 16 plus points per game instead of 13, it was 24 last year as opposed to 13 in 2021. I mean, that's a huge increase from one year to the next, and it's had a completely transformative effect. And I'll point out that 2021 wasn't even the height of juice ball era. You want to compare this to 2019? I'm, I'm sure those comparisons are even more ridiculous. You know, one thing that is worth keeping in mind is that, and this was something that I struggled with when I was writing my starting pitcher preview was like, Last year, we had eight starters with an ERA under three qualify for the ERA title compared to 10 or eight in 2021, 10 in 2022, raise the bar to three, five, 18 in 2021, 30 in 2022. One thing that I haven't looked into is just there were probably just a lot fewer pitchers who qualified for the ERA title in 2021 than 2022. So that that's another thing to keep in mind. Yeah, I, I made sure, let's see, I don't remember exactly where I put the cutoff, but it wasn't just qualified for ERA yeah. title. I think it was like 100 innings or something like that. Yeah, I mean, we did see innings kind of bounce back a little bit last year compared to 2021. Obviously, 2021 coming off the shortened season, but we're still way down from where we were at in 2019. So uh, back in 2019, we had 15 pitchers go 200 plus innings, and we had uh, 33 go 180 plus. And in 2021, that was four with 200 and 20, uh, 20 that went with 180 plus. And then last year it was eight with 200 innings and 27. So again, it's like, we're not where we were in 2019, but obviously we are, you know, as, as we get further away from the short in 2020, I think, um, we're probably, this is probably where we're going to live in terms of innings, but it, it, ha it is better now than it was at least, uh, two years ago. Before we get into ADP, just a quick thought and just let, let everyone know, what, what goes into ranking starting pitchers for you guys? Because, I mean, I, I'm sure the process is different for every and everybody. And, frankly, I'm, I'm pretty interested to hear. I don't know that I've ever asked you guys this question. But, like, what are some factors that you look at when ranking starting pitchers? Or, I guess, you know, if you're breaking a tie between a certain a certain couple of pitchers. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, first, I, I, it depends on, like, the problem is there, there are different things that I look for depending on the type of starting pitcher we're talking about. Because, like, some guys, FIP is really, really useful. Some guys, it's just like that's who they are, and they will mostly pitch to their ERA estimators, and, and you don't have to really go all that deep. But then there are, you know, Sandy Alcantara's and, and Julio Arias and, and guys like that who just consistently seem to vex the projection systems. And, and I think you have to give those guys another look. And, you know, they, they tend to... I think look better on a second look. And, and I think those are, you know, guys who potentially pitch to contact more aren't elite strikeout guys, but also seem to have real skills when it comes to a limiting quality of contact. And so there's no one right or wrong answer. There's no one size fits all to ranking starting pitchers. It's just, you kind of do have to take them on a case by case basis. However, that being said on a high level, I, I do tend to now more than ever value volume. And while I do tend to view all pitchers as relatively risky when it comes to injuries, I think I'm less willing to give the benefit of the doubt for pitcher injuries and guys who just haven't shown that they can do the 200 innings. Like I'm just going to be a little lower on Spencer Strider this year than the yeah. consensus, just like I was with Shane McClanahan last year. And it, it made me look bad for most of the season. And I think in the end, you know, he probably more or less lived up to his draft price, probably exceeded it. But like, it's also just, it remains true that it's really, really hard to throw 180 innings in the majors and, and do it well. 
And guys who haven't shown that they can do that, I'm just going to be pretty skeptical of them. Yeah, that's that's something I've adhered to for a few years. And I'm man, I'm I was thinking Spencer Strider's ADP was being elevated in an FBC, but it's gotten even higher since <laughs> all these other sources have come. He's now the number six. Well, at least Shohei Otani, but he's the number five SP yeah. according to ADP. He's like fifteenth for and me like, for the same I, reason. I think he's awesome. Yeah, I mean, inning for inning, he was probably the best pitcher in baseball last year. Well, but... Jacob Degrom threw a hundred through sixty four innings, but if you count, if you count ERA him, was a lot higher. Degrom's was? Yeah, it was over yeah. three. It wasn't really. Yeah. yeah. All right. Fourteen K um, per nine is pretty good. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's almost what Strider had. Anyway, but yeah. um. Back it's, to it's the... just I can't justify a top five SP price for a guy who I don't think has ever thrown 140 innings as a professional. Right. Let no, alone my, 160. My standard, my standard as far as workload goes for the, and this has spanned several years now. Um, if I haven't seen you do it, I don't trust. I mm-hmm. don't necessarily trust that you can do it. And even if I've seen you do it once, like even if you want to point, oh, Cor- Corbin Burns, he got to 200 innings now. He's going to, he got to 200 innings last year. He's going to be a 200 inning pitcher going forward. I don't necessarily trust you can repeat it until I see you repeat it. I mean, these teams are so careful with managing workloads these days for good reason. And also injuries are so common uh, that kind of the, it's it's the the thought that everybody's going to develop into 180 inning pitcher. I mean, obviously that's so antiquated now. It seems not even worth bringing up. But like it's it's not even for sure everybody's going to develop into 160 inning pitcher these days. So I I have you know I'm I'm certainly hopeful that Spencer Strider can reach that 160 inning threshold this year, but I'm, I'm not ready to assume he will. And that's why I'm not willing to rank him that high, but getting back to the original question, how we go about ranking our starting pitchers. Uh, I would say that I start with that number. I cite so often uh, points per game and just kind of use that as a framework to, to work off of. And, and then I look at everything I can for each pit pitcher individually uh, i look at under I, I look at predictor stats like xfip which is the one i leaned on most during the juice ball era and xcra which is stat cast based on batted ball data um, i'm starting to lean a little more toward xcra in the era we're in now where quality of contact probably matters more than uh than it did during the juice ball era but I think they're both worth looking at. I look at strikeout rate. I look at swinging strike rate, walk rate, you know, all everything I could look at. But one thing that uh, maybe people don't think of is I look at the game log. And if I don't see a lot of sixes and sevens in there, I'm downgrading you a lot. Because to uh, I wouldn't say that starts that are less than six innings are worthless. But that's an easier way to think about it. Just if if you're not going six innings in a start, that start is pretty close to worthless to me because you're very likely not getting a win. And win is the most valuable stat in fantasy, regardless of the format. Um, And also, it's just not, you know, innings are valuable in their own right, whether you're talking about points leagues, the three points of peach, or or roto leagues, where uh, obviously more innings are, are make the ERA and whip count for more. So that's why somebody like Jeffrey Springs, I mean, yeah, the ratios look great. I could see why people like him as a sleeper, but he was kind of a glorified long reliever next last year. And I, I don't know if that's going to change. If it changes, great. He's a big breakout. If it doesn't, then, you know, he, he's not as good as his ERA whip and K per nine would suggest. I mean, not I- as valuable anyway. I think more than any offseason ever before, I've really just kind of focused in on on the skills for certain pitchers. Well, really all pitchers. I've made this huge spreadsheet with K minus walk rate and swinging strike rate and FIP, Sierra, innings pitch per start. Uh, and then also looking at, you know, projection systems like ATC and Steamer. Scott, close your ears. I know you won't want to hear that. Uh, but I do value their opinion because um, 
frankly, those are, you know, some of the most accurate projection systems out there. And I just trust them to, to analyze starting pitchers better than me. Um, so I look at all those things combined. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty tough admittedly. So we'll talk through at least, you know, the first 20 or so pitchers on today's podcast, but before we do that, let's take a uh, quick break and we'll be back right after this. Equality gets no timeouts or tryouts or second chances. February reminds us we could change our circumstances. We give thanks to the athletes who took big risks, who beat the odds despite being eyeballs because of their skin. But to change the status quo, you have to be willing when silence is comfortable. Speaking out is an act of resistance. This is the month we remember. But more importantly, we dream of something bigger. All right, welcome back to Fantasy Baseball Today. Apologies to those watching us live on YouTube. I'm trying to figure out how to get this spinning black box off when my connection messed up, but it's not going away. I backed out a few times and came back in. and That's like just that. that's just Ghost Frank. Yeah, that's what we'll go with. Uh, <laughs> all right, so let's start off with ADP. And in case you think that conversation was like way too long, wow, 30 minutes on strategy. I think if there's any position to do it for, it's it's starting pitcher. And, and we're going to have two more position previews just dedicated to starting pitchers after this one. So we'll get to uh, all the names, hopefully. Two names go in the early second round. That's right. No starting pitchers going in the first round this year. Overall, pitching has been pushed down a little bit this season. And we'll start off with Corbin Burns, who has an ADP of 14.6. And going just after him is Garrett Cole, who has an ADP of 17. Corbin Burns, over the past three years, first in ERA, first in WHIP, first in K per nine, and first in K percentage. Of course, that is among qualified starting pitchers. He had a very weird, let's not call it weird, let's call it what it is. It was a bad seven-start stretch last year from August through September. But, you know, I dug a little bit deeper, Scott, and I couldn't really find anything that either explained what was going on or made me worried that it's something that can linger for Corbin Burns. So I think it's totally fine for him to be either, you know, SP1, SP2, you know, yeah. no lower than a top three or top five starting pitcher. Yeah, I think that's fine too. And I understand why he's the consensus number one. It, it, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about him breaking the 200 inning threshold last year. Um, so, you know, now he has the ratios of an ace and the volume of an ace. He's as true of an ace as you're going to find. The reason I rank, uh, at least in five by five leagues, both Justin Verlander and Max Scherzer ahead is because Burns has only reached that threshold once and reaching that threshold once is almost like a signifier to me that you're vulnerable to injury this year. Unless you show me you could do it a second time. I'm not sure. I, I don't feel, I, I don't, I'm not at a point where I can assume. I, I, I think it given the state of the game, I don't think we can just assume that your arm's going to be able to hold up to those rigors year after year. And we know Verlanders and Scherzers has can because they have for many years. And um, I know Scherzers had some health issues the past couple of years, but they haven't been arm related is the point. And uh, I feel more, you know, they still have the elite ratios as well, Verlander and Scherzer. So I, I give them a slight edge over Burns. Um, and just where he's going, there's basically no chance I'm going to end up drafting Burns. Are they like whales in here? What is that? You guys hearing that noise? Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, the cops are coming for you, Scott, because they hear. Look, you. I live, I, I live right off of a very busy street in in Brooklyn, like a half a mile away from a hospital. <laughs> so it just it is what it is, you know. That's that's the explanation there. Uh, Chris, I don't know, man. I, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to ride that mute button as best as I can it, between it just, the trains and the sirens, and yeah, it sounded like whales singing to me with you riding the mute button. <laughs> I don't know, that was strange. Uh, let's talk about Garrett Cole as ADP of seventeen. Well, hold on, I do want to point out with Corbin Burns, he's only been on the IL twice in his major league career for injuries. Now. One of them was a shoulder issue back in 2019. He missed 15 days. And then the oblique injury that ended his 2020, 2020 season. So we don't know how much time he would have missed. Uh, injury happened like his last start of the season. So he, he doesn't have a spotless track record, but like he did throw 145 innings as a 22 year old in 2017. He threw 
like 120 the following year, but that was because he spent 30 in 30 appearances pitching out of the bullpen. He has, I mean, it's like you said, he hasn't proven he can do the 200 innings every year, but as far as pitchers go, and especially 27 year old pitchers, he's got about as good a track record as you can ask for. Right. You know, he doesn't have the Tommy John surgery in his background as far. I don't think he does at least. Um, but when Maybe you're parsing between a bunch of really sure. good pitchers for number one overall honors, I I think I just I know, also some... think he's got the skills. Like I, I think his skill set is as good as anyone. Yeah, and so that that's why I give him like the edge over Verlander and Scherzer. I mean, it's hard to top their skill set either, though. It, Verlander's a really tough one. I guess we'll talk about him and about seven minutes or so when we get there. But I mean, we can just talk about it now. He, his skill set last year wasn't as good, or at least the things that we typically look for, uh, the strikeout rate, the swing strike rate were way down last season. And he was still amazing. Obviously he had, they, there were for a lot of good pitchers though. And I think, but not, you know, Corbin, consi- not Corbin Burns though. Well, no, but I mean, Verlander is obviously, I mean, he's one of the best pitchers ever. So like it's it's kind of an unfair comparison, but he's really like he knows what he's doing in a way that you wouldn't think somebody like Corbin Burns does. And I think considering Verlander's velocity was fine, you know, 39 years old, coming back from Tommy John surgery, still throws the ball very hard, as hard as he ever has. Um, I think it was by design, you know, like. He he saw the way the ball was carrying and decided he didn't need to go for swings as miss, misses as much anymore. And you know what? He led the majors in ERA and WHIP. So good on him. He won the Cy Young. Like I, I think he knows what he's doing. I don't think it was just oh he's losing it and the ERA and WHIP is a mirage. I don't think that's it at all. You might be right, Scott, but that kind of feels like slippery slope analysis where. We don't really have anything to prove it outside of like the guile that is Justin Verlander. I mean, the results not- kind of prove it, don't they? I guess, but I mean, I hear what Chris is saying too, where the swinging strike rate is down and the whiff rate on his fastball is way down from where it was, you know, two years ago when he was, or three years ago when he was. Well, and was like the, so. the pitches themselves were like not as effective, like the, no, at getting swings and misses, the, sw- the swinging strike rate was down on all of his pitches pretty much across the board. And look, He's a Houston Astro. His spin rate was down. He do was, with that. He do was with that. What Astro. do with that? What you right? He was a Houston yeah, Astro. Now. Do with that what you will. Which, I just which maybe is another reason to avoid him. I don't know. I think it's fair to assume that he is going to continue to be an ERA standout. It's just is that two six? I think it's probably closer to that. And if that comes with one hundred ninety five strikeouts or two hundred and five strikeouts. And Corbin Burns gives you a similar ERA, but with 250 strikeouts. I, I think it gets pretty easy to give Corbin Burns the edge there. One last point that's driven me to this conclusion on Verlander. So his his swinging strike rate last year was 11.6%, according to fan graphs. It was lower than the previous three seasons, one of which was only one start. I mean, mm-hmm. 2018 and 2019 were much higher than 11.6%. They're also the outliers for his entire career. I mean, 11.6% is a top five swinging strike rate for him. So, like, this is familiar territory for for Verlander, who for his, basically his entire career, there's that weird span toward the end of his uh, time with the Tigers where he wasn't a fantasy ace, but for basically his entire career. Where he wasn't using the sticky stuff. (laughs) (laughs) I think the, the... Point here, the overarching point is that if you like Verlander as much or even more than Corbin Burns or Garrett Cole, then you have no business to yeah. either one of these guys. Just wait right. until the end of the third or early fourth round and, and take Justin Verlander. We'll get to his ADP in just a little bit. Let's quickly talk about Garrett Cole. I still have him ranked as my SP1, and you know, some people were laughing at me and yelling at me. What do you mean? Garrett Cole, he had a 3.50 ERA last year. He still led baseball in strikeouts with 257 strikeouts. He also led the American League in home runs allowed. I guess it depends whether or not you believe this whole, the Yankees were playing with different balls down the stretch and 
Aaron Judge with the home run chase. Obviously, Garrett Cole was pitching in a lot of those games as well. Either way, Garrett Cole is not the standout that he once was. I, I think we're beyond the days of like a mid two ZRA, yeah. him being the best pitcher in baseball by far. But Chris, we have enough of a track record here where I think he could still pitch to a low three ZRA with the most strikeouts in baseball, and he's doing it over the course of 200 innings. So that's why I still have him as my SP1. Right. You said he's no longer a standout. That's partially true. He's no longer a standout in ERA, and I think that's probably a safe assumption moving forward because he gets hit really hard when he gives up contact. Like, that's just he's – a, he's a fly ball pitcher. He gets – but like you said, still among the league leaders in strikeout rate every year. Still very good control. Still, I think, arguably one of the five best bets for 200 innings in baseball. So if you have to not be a standout in terms of skill set somewhere, the stat that's prone to a lot of fluctuation outside of a pitcher's control isn't a bad one to be a to not be a standout in. Like the stuff that Garrett Cole can control, he's really, really good at. And like 13 wins last season, I think you take the over on that. 3.50 ERA last year. I think you take the under on that. Even if it's a 3.2 ERA and he's no longer, you know, one of the best in baseball at preventing runs, he's so good at everything else that I think he's a more than worthwhile pick, especially if it's more like the second half of the second round. All right. So my my one issue with drafting, I mean, obviously I don't want to take any pitcher in round two, but the, the big problem with taking Garrett Cole in round two is if you're going to invest that much in a starting pitcher, it's really hard to do it in one who's going to put you in a hole in ERA, you know, like his ERA could be Aaron Nola. I mean, Chris, Chris was saying Aaron Nola with his 3.25 ERA, uh, isn't what did, what did you say about Aaron Nola's ERA? It wasn't not, a, he's not a standout. He's not a it's standout. Same way, so yeah. that, and that's probably Garrett Cole's high end for ERA. Is like it might be closer to 350 as it was last year. And that in this environment is like you're going to be making up ground in ERA after being one of the first to take a starting pitcher. I still have Garrett Cole as a top five starting pitcher. Don't get me wrong, but he does by ACE standards feel like a liability in that category. And my next point on Garrett Cole is that I won't be drafting him either unless he somehow falls to, I don't know, the third round, which. We've done a few mocks where he falls to the end of the second, but in most drafts, that's probably not happening with Garrett, with Garrett Cole. Only one pitcher is going uh, in the second round after these guys. So I guess, you know, third starting pitcher going in the second round, but it is Sandy Alcantara who has an ADP of 23, the National League Cy Young Award winner last year, 2.28 ERA, 0.98 whip, led baseball by far in innings pitched, 228 and two thirds. Aaron Nola was the next closest at 205. Sandy Alcantara averaged just <laughs> over seven innings per start. No other pitcher was yeah. above six and a half, which um, obviously that can never happen, but just calculations wise, that's where we're at. Here's what worries me. And, you know, you guys can feel free to, uh, you know, tell me why I'm wrong. But this, I have wrote up Sandy as a bust. I don't think he's going to bottom out. I just think he's a little bit overvalued. And here's why. Last year, his FIP was closer to three. His XERA also closer to three. Those are still great, but if he gives up more runs, that will cause him to be less efficient. And as a result, I don't know that he will be far and away the, the league leader in innings pitched as he has been, as he was last year, right? And he needed all of those innings just to finish eighth in strikeouts in all of baseball. Why? Because he was 26th in K per nine. He was 21st in K percentage. And on top of all that, he had a 262 Babbitt, four year best. He gets a lot of ground balls. The Marlins shifted the fifth most in baseball. So I think he's going to give up more hits and there's going to be more runners on base. And he's just not going to be as efficient. And as a result, he'll probably throw like 210 innings or 205 or something like that. And his strikeouts will be a lot worse because the strikeout rate is not as good as other elite aces. So he won't bottom out. But Scott, I think he's overvalued right now. Hmm. I hear what you're saying, and I agree that his ERA will probably be closer to three than than two, as it was this past year. But I think once you're in the club as an innings eater, you're in the club, and they're like, an, as long as you're not walking a bunch of guys and driving up your pitch count that way, they're going to let you do your thing. Um, Sandy Alcantara exactly 
exactly half his starts last year, 16 of the 32, were more than seven innings. Not seven innings or more, more than seven innings. Just unheard of in the modern game. And, you know, barring injury, I think he's going to remain an outlier in that category. And that's why, you know, I, I kept stipulating Justin Verlander's my top starting pitcher in five by five leagues. That's because Sandy Alcantara is my number one pitcher in points leagues where, you know, CBS standard scoring, every inning is three points. Every third of an inning is one point. And Sandy Alcantara is going to distance, distance himself from the pack uh, just through accumulating innings in that scoring format. He's still top five in Roto for me, but I think uh, I think it makes a difference, the scoring I, format. I do have a couple of other things to note. One, Frank, you're out of the club. <laughs> I know, you're I no know. longer allowed to be a Marlins fan. Such Which a club. We have one that's, good that's thing club. going for us, <laughs> and you're trying to poop on it. Don't appreciate that. Sorry. Two, like, you know, 262 BABIP is his best over the past four years. Technically correct, the best kind of correct. However, 270, 274, 271, it's not an outlier. Like he probably had a best case scenario season last season. And I think that's the knock against Sandy Alcantara, right? Is that he had the best case scenario season last year and he wasn't far and away the best pitcher in fantasy. If Max Scherzer has his best case scenario season, you're probably talking about a much better outcome than what Sandy Alcantara gave you last season, if only because you're probably going to get 45 more strikeouts from him than you would from Sandy Alcantara, maybe more. But he has a 310 career ERA, 370 FIP, 4 X FIP. X ERA doesn't calculate for a whole career, but he's been better in X ERA than ERA, or better than in ERA than X ERA every single season of his career. Usually significantly better. Last season, it was about th two-thirds of a run. The year before, it was about a third of a run. The year before, a full run. Generally speaking, there's, I, I think XERA accounts for the ways in which pitchers like Sandy Alcantara do a good job of limiting quality of contact. For whatever reason, he is even better at it than this stat is able to account for. And that's why, like, I would take the under on three ERA. I'd probably take the under on two, seven, five. There's it's possible we get a skills regression, but I also think it's possible. Like this is a dude who could just start striking out more batters. I, I think there's no, there's no yeah. skills limitation the for Sandy strike Alcantara. rates always been higher than and the, so, the, the caper nine would have you. And believe. so if he does start seeing a little bit less efficiency on balls in play, it's entirely possible he just becomes a strikeout printing guy and is really, really good. I think it's possible, Chris. I agree. His stuff is filthy, but we just we haven't seen it. Sure, so it's that's not fair. something that I would bank on happening. And I just looked into because I wanted to see this. Your point is valid about the bad. It was not an outlier last year, but it's been consistently good. Maybe that's by Sandy's own doing by obviously inducing a lot of soft contact. The Marlins have been top ten in shift percentage each of the past three full seasons. Now there's shift restrictions. Luis Arise is their second baseman, not noted as a good fielder. Joey Wendell is their starting shortstop. I just see ways that this can go wrong. And again, I don't think he's going to bottom out. I just think he's kind of overvalued and you're buying on a career year right now for Sandy Alcantara. There's one more pitcher that's kind of on his own before we get into this huge glob of starting pitchers. It's Jacob deGrom, who has an ADP of 29.8. What do we do with Jacob deGrom? He signed a five-year, $185 million deal with the Rangers this offseason. Since the start of 2018, he's first in ERA, second in whip, third in K per nine, first in swinging strike rate by far, 17.3%. Max Scherzer is next at 15.8%. I mean, that is just... These are reliever numbers. 10% better, yeah. This is not normal for a starting pitcher to do things like this. He is the best pitcher on the pro uh, planet. The problem is that he has not hit 100 innings since 2019. Uh, over the past three seasons, he's missed time due to neck, lat, back, shoulder, forearm, and elbow issues. He's now 34 years old, and he's dealing with left side soreness already in spring training. Like, the first couple of days, he's out there with the Rangers, and, and he's dealing with with uh, left side soreness. So, Scott, I appreciate Jacob DeGrom. He's a Hall of Famer. I think he's one of the mm -hmm. best pitchers to ever do it. 
I will not be drafting him as an ADP <laughs> inside the top 30 this season. Is he a Hall of Famer, though? I yes. yes. Oh, yeah. 41.1 war accumulated in his career. I don't know. Uh, He's got five seasons he... left. <laughs> <laughs> Which At will least. add up to like 250 innings. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Chris and I, you know, had that little back and forth about how, you know, who was better. Who was the best pitcher per inning last year, Spencer Strider or Jacob deGrom? Well, Jacob deGrom probably will be this year. I mean, he's a safe bet to be that every year. But the key is per inning. And uh, I'm at a point where I, I, I don't think we can presume anything's going to change along those lines. You know, this this drop in innings coincided with a boost in velocity. I think that's the scariest part to me. Um is that Jacob deGrom went from being another hard thrower to like the hardest thrower in the world. And it made him even better on a per inning basis. It, it made him put up swinging strike rates, like the best relievers in baseball, you know, far above any other starting pitcher, complete outlier as far as those go. But because it coincides so neatly with him uh, being unable to stay healthy for even a hundred innings at a time, you know, I, I I can't help but think it's just more than his body is able to take on. And uh, at age 34, I don't see why that would change. Like, I, it's it's a rare instance of a pit. Like, I'd, I'd almost feel better if he started throwing softer. And, you know, you never say that about a pitcher. But in DeGrom's case, I mean, he was already the best pitcher in the world yeah. before he took on that extra velocity. Like, if that allows him to hold up better, that's obviously preferable. And just for some context... 2018, he had that 170 ERA, 217 innings through 96.3 miles per hour. Still one of the hardest throwing pitchers in baseball, or starters at least. 2019, 243 ERA, 204 innings, 97.1 miles per hour. Up a little bit, but, you know, within the, the range. 98.7, 99.1, 98.9 uh, miles per hour average fastball velocity over the past three seasons, and has not had more innings than his average fastball velocity in that three start <laughs> three year stretch. I will say 2020, he stayed healthy. He made his 12 starts <laughs> through 68 innings. It was only 68 innings, but he at least managed yeah. to avoid injury in that season. Uh, but no, I, I, I agree. I mean, like, I guess the case for Jacob deGrom is like, you're going to get Edwin Diaz numbers regardless just as a floor you're not going to get the saves obviously but like he's <laughs> yeah, going to give you what the edwin most Di important right part. which is the only reason edwin diaz goes but like <laughs> edwin diaz will be drafted around this range and give you very similar numbers and jacob de could throw 120 more innings than that yeah. you know i don't Good. think he will but he could and if he throws 160 innings there's a pretty decent chance jacob de is the best pitcher in fantasy I think if he throws 160, Chris, he could be the best player in fantasy. It's not just pitcher. I mean, that's how dominant Jacob DeGrom is. It's just, he's the ultimate risk award. It's if he, if he can get anywhere close to that, you know, again, you have the best player in fantasy, but what we've seen the past couple of years is 60, 70, 80 innings. So yeah, that's, yeah. That's the I would bet on, I would I bet on more than that? Is that the right way to put that? I, I bet think on it, over a hundred. I think that's the, the, it is more likely than not that he throws 100 innings this year, but not I guess that so. much more likely. I get like somewhere in the 100 to 120 range, I guess is no, let's say somewhere in the 90 to 120 range is what I'm expecting for DeGrom this year, which would be, you know, it might, it might be as highest of the past four years, if that's the case. All right, let's take one more break here. Before we do that, uh, we are closing in on 1,000 TikTok followers, so make sure to follow us. If you haven't already, search for FBT Pod on TikTok or go to tiktok.com slash at FBT Pod. We'll be back right after this. Meanwhile, on Paramount Mountain. Okay, we have the Northern Face, the Southern Face, and... The Sylvester Stallone Face. Stallone! Of course. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? Is that Dad? Uh, yeah. No, 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 don't sneeze. Oh, dear God, no. Hold it. Hold it. Don't do it. Go. Ha! Gesundheit. Well, thank you. You're welcome. 
Let's get back into ADP, and we are at the glob. Eight starting pitchers going from picks 33 to 42. So good luck figuring out which ones you like. But this is probably the range where you start off with a couple of hitters. You're going to be living in this range in your drafts. Aaron Nola at an ADP of 33.4. Shane McClanahan also at 33.4. And Spencer Strider at 34. We'll, we'll start with just these three. We'll get into the other ones just after this. I don't know what it is about Aaron Nola. I, I just can't draft him. He's really valuable for fantasy purposes, and I can't blame anyone if they want to, but if you look at his ERA by year, it's just wildly inconsistent. Since 2016, 478, 354, 237, 387, 328, 463, 325. If you and can tell me which Aaron Nola is going to show up, then yes, please do. Tell me. Even Even more than that, like... He, he even the the direction in which he's pitched relative to his peripherals has kind of been different every year. The last two years, he's been much worse than his XERA. But prior to that, he'd been a decent bit better than his XERA. So it's like it's not even a situation where you can say, well, he just gets hit hard and it makes it hard for him to live up to his expectations. Or, you know, he's got this Sandy Alcantara thing. He doesn't really fit into an easy box and i wonder if it's like he's got very good but not elite stuff and it just leaves his margin for error a little slimmer than most pitchers and so he has to be perfect but like even saying that the guy that i've always said that about is shane bieber and it's a very different situation than shane bieber because aaronola really doesn't get hit all that hard relative to the major league average. He's pretty close yeah. to the league average. I don't know. I think you guys are wringing your hands a little too much over this. I, I think Aaron Nola is great. I think, um, I think it's really just the ERA category that you're worrying right. about with the inconsistency. The strikeouts have reached a point where they're very consistent. The whip's always going to be good because his control's good. It's basically just 2019, which was the most Homer-friendly year Mm -hmm. ever maybe not literally ever but close and 2021 um which we all knew was a fluke that 463 yes. era that year like everything about it seemed off and he came he, he had a nice bounce back season last year what 2019 and 2021 have in common is far more home runs than he's given up in any other year like i mm -hmm. said 2019 was uh was an outlier league wide for home runs given up 2021 was pre dejuiced ball at least widespread use of the the dejuiced ball um it's still part of the juice ball era as far as i'm concerned 2021 so now that we're in an era where home runs aren't as plentiful like i, I don't think we need to worry about that bugaboo so much with nola anymore like he he was able to avoid it at times, even during the juice ball era. But uh, when he did struggle with the ERA, that was the reason why. And so I, I just, I don't think it's going to be an issue for him anymore. I think and even if it is, of, he's, he's giving you all those other good ratios. Yeah. I, he, I think he's very much like a poor man's Garrett Cole. Like he'll give you like across the board, like 90% of Garrett Cole last year, his whip was better than Cole's that, that hasn't necessarily been the case the last few years. So I, like, I think he's a very, very good pitcher, probably at least potentially underrated. Um, I have him ranked right in this range, and uh, I think he's I think he's great. The only thing with him, and you might be right, Scott, I, I could just be a hater. Maybe it's just like a bias of mine, but I, I'll always find another pitcher going in this range or later that I will prefer to take over Aaron Nola, but that's just me. Um, he's turning 30 years old this year, and it is a contract year, so if you subscribe to the contract year theory, then maybe Nola is for you. Well, he is going ahead of Justin Verlander, so I guess I can't disagree with you there. But there like go. my the the high end, like the top fifteen in my starting pitcher rankings are so so out of step with the consensus rankings. Like, I, I've I I I feel like I usually 
play things down the middle, you know, and it, it makes me very uncomfortable that they're, they're so out of sorts like that. But, you know, I try to convince myself to change them to sync up more with the, with the ADP. And I just, I'm not selling myself on it. So I think everybody else is doing it wrong, but ultimately I don't even care about the starting pitchers that much. Cause I'm probably not going to draft from it. So that well, some people might be drafting pitching Scott. So we've got to tell them what to do. Uh, Shane McClanahan. Last year, before he suffered this shoulder impingement in late August, he was arguably the AL Cy Young frontrunner. It was basically him and Verlander and, and I guess Dylan Cease up to that point as well. And uh, even with that, Shane McClanahan was awesome last year. 2.54 ERA, 0 0.93 whip, 194 strikeouts over 166 and a third. His 15.5% swinging strike rate tied for first in baseball. But he did have that shoulder impingement. He returned for four final starts. And during that time, he had an ERA over five. His swinging strike rate was below 10%. Uh, and he had just 12 strikeouts in 19 innings pitched. So Scott Shane McClanahan right now, he's kind of off my board just because I need to see something. I've got to see or hear something in spring training. But if that happens, then I think I could very easily be back in on Shane McClanahan. I just kind of need more information. Yeah, this is the one that surprised me because I thought I was going to be a downer on Shane McClanahan coming into this year. Um, but... My initial rankings had him in that same group with Burns, Cole, Alcantara as like the best of the best starting pitch. He was like the lowest of that group, but I saw it as a clear top seven for Lander and Scherzer in it, McClanahan bringing up the rear. Uh, so the fact that I'm actually higher than the consensus on him, I didn't see it coming. Uh, I like that he is one of the best bat missers in baseball and one of the best ground ball generators in baseball. That is a good combination for um, preventing damage. It was a better combination during the juice ball year. I'll grant that, but it's still a really good pair of qualities to have there for McClanahan. The problem as you point out is that like we were talking about at the, the, the top with accumulation of innings, you know, he, he entered unfamiliar territory there with hundred about the time he got around 150 innings and then his shoulder started barking. And then when he got back from the shoulder injury, uh, those final five starts, he had just a 10% swinging strike rate compared to 16.3% before that. That's the most concerning number of all to me. The velocity was still pretty good for what it's worth. So, you know, maybe it was just a five star fluke, but coinciding with the injury, who knows? And so, there's still a big volume. Even if McClanahan, you know, seems totally fine this spring, totally healthy, which I expect, there's still going to be a major volume question there. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, am I higher on him than the consensus? Am I lower on him than the consensus? I, I don't. I mean, technically, I guess I'm higher, but I understand the concerns if that's where they're coming from. Last season, Spencer Strider was arguably the top pitcher on a per inning basis. I know, obviously, we mentioned Jacob deGrom, but 200 strikeouts in 130 innings pitched, the quickest to ever accomplish that feat. First in FIP last year, first in K-minus walk rate, tied for first in swinging strike rate. Spencer Strider is a freak. Chris, the question, as you presented earlier, is what are the innings going to look like for Spencer Strider? He's entering into age 24 season. He, and we, a very limited track record. He was drafted in 2020, only threw 94 innings in 2021, and then 134 total last year because he did pitch a little bit in the postseason. Even if he gets to 160, he could give us like 230, 240 strikeouts, which would be among the league leaders. So where are you at on Spencer Strider and this price tag? I think it's too high. I have him as a bust based on this price range, but I he's a top... 12 ish starting pitcher for me. So it's certainly not, I'm not entirely out on him. I just like 160 innings is probably pretty close to a best case scenario, especially for a team that has world series aspirations. So they probably aren't going, you know, they're going to want to conserve him. The question is one, how do they go about conserving him? I can't imagine he's going to pitch out of the bullpen this season. So is it going to be, you know, we don't let him throw a hundred pitches every start. Is it going to be, we, you know, limit him to four innings, a couple of starts throughout the year, something like that. There's going to be some kind of limitation. My guess is it's going to end up being a pretty natural limitation. There's going to be some kind of IL stint because he's a 24 year old starting pitcher. That's what happens to 24 year old starting pitchers. And it might end up being a non-issue. 
you know, it might just be that he goes on the IL for three weeks and then he's able to, to pitch normally. But when you look at the total package and he does have a Tommy John surgery in his history, it was before he got drafted the 2019 uh, year for what it's worth. Um, but when you look at the total package, I think he's a very, very good pitcher. Do I think he's head and shoulders better than Justin Verlander or Max Scherzer or Brandon Woodruff, who I'm actually a little lower on than the consensus? I don't think he's so much better than those guys that I'm willing to just ignore the fact that his best case scenario for innings doesn't come close to being enough. Yeah. And for those who play in head to head points leagues on CBS, Spencer Strider is SPARP eligible. So that's starting pitcher with relief pitcher eligibility. That is one, one exception <laughs> and in a, in a points league that RP eligibility is going to be super valuable. He's and basically he's, a cheat code. So, and he's the only one who I really care about this year. There, there'll probably be some others who are drafted like Hunter Brown and, and Garrett Whitlock, but like, Guys who aren't in rotations right now. <laughs> no, Whit Whitlock is, but yeah, Spencer Strider is the only one who um, who I trust to actually deliver on that. Uh, you know, to 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 deliver worthwhile numbers to 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 be worth passing over a closer for. All right, let's move on to this next mini glob inside of the bigger glob. Three more names. Brandon Woodruff with an ADP of 36.2. Justin Verlander at 37.8. And Dylan Cease at 39. We'll stop there before we get to pick 40. And we'll start with Woodruff. Chris, I want to ask you uh, why, what you're worried about when it comes to Woodruff. Um, last year, he went on the IL with an ankle sprain. And turned out he had Raynaud syndrome, which causes numbness in the fingers. And at the time... I remember I was freaking out. It was mm -hmm. Scott probably had to calm me down because I always freak out whenever things like this happen. But once he returned, Woodruff was amazing. Uh, final 18 starts, 2.38 ERA, 1.00 whip, 2.79 FIP, 11.2 K per nine, 14.5% swinging strike rate. And it kind of just feels like he's getting better and better, Chris. So uh, what, are you, what are you worried about when it comes to Woodruff? He's really, really good. I, I think the one thing is for a guy who's, being drafted comfortably as an ace, he doesn't have the track record of having thrown the innings. You know, he he is someone who, over the past couple of seasons, he's mostly avoided injuries. You know, it was more early on in his career. Um, but we've still never seen him reach 180 innings in a regular season. And that's not to say that he can't, as we've talked about. There's, it's, even the guys who've never done it. Like, I think Spencer Strider's probably an outlier among the group that we're talking about, where, like, I think he probably cannot throw 180 innings this season. I, th I would be very, very surprised if he did. I don't want to say he cannot, but probably will not. Everyone else, Shane McClanahan could. He got close enough last year. Brandon Woodruff has gotten close enough. But when you're talking about when you have to split hairs at this point, I just I don't think Brandon Woodruff is so much better than Max Scherzer to justify yeah. a gap in their price. And I think Max Scherzer is more likely to throw the 180 innings. I think Carlos Rodon is probably pretty unlikely to throw the 180 innings, relatively speaking, although he got there last year more or less. I think Carlos Rodon's a better pitcher than Brandon Woodruff. So it's kind of – he kind of just like – he doesn't quite reach the Shane McClanahan, Spencer Strider, Carlos Rodon level as a pitcher. And I think he has some of the workload concerns that just – push him down a little bit. I think we're splitting hairs with all these guys. He's my SP 12. He's what SP eight in ADP. So I'm just a little bit lower. And that's, I'm, I'm glad you point out the, the hair splitting that's going on here. And, and that's, that's kind of how I feel about this whole, you know, the top 15 starting pitchers, like, like what I was bringing up before, the reason my rankings are so out of sorts with the consensus is because I think you could rank those guys in close to any order you want. And you'll have a pretty good argument for it. Yeah. And that's it. That is the strongest reason why it just doesn't make sense to draft a pitcher in round one or round two. Uh, you know, I've, I've said I'm probably not going to do it around three either, but like there are still going to be leftovers from this group in round four. So unless you really have the strong favorite or you're intending to draft more than one, I don't, I don't think it makes sense to reach for any of them. Yeah. 
I, I am the high guy here on Woodruff. I feel like the underlying skills are just a little bit better than some of the other names in this range, like the Aaron Nolas of the world. But uh, you're right. I mean, he's not on the level of a Spencer Strider. I also feel a little bit safer about the innings for Woodruff than I do Strider. Like, yeah, oh, 100%. Woodruff, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I think Woodruff can easily throw like 180 this year, even though yes. he hasn't done it in the regular season. I would say he, look, he hasn't pitchers, done it. He got 179.1. So he's. Among, among the pitchers we're talking about today, the only one who's a bigger innings risk than Strider is DeGrom. Yeah. 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 That's totally fair. We're up to Justin Verlander. We spoke about him quite a bit earlier on, but Scott, you said probably not taking a pitcher in the first three rounds. Well, maybe yeah. Verlander's for you because his ADP is 37.8. So in a 12 team league, yeah. early fourth round there. Look, the, the ratios were ridiculous last year 175 ERA, 0.83 whip. Even if he pitches closer to his FIP, 2.49, his XERA, 2.66. I think that's probably what you should expect. And if you expect that, it's still really good. The only thing, Scott, is the only worry I have. The fastball spin rate was down about 150 RPM from 2019, which I get was a long time ago, but that was the last full season we saw him. Uh, and the whiff rate was down on that pitch. Outside of that, I mean, everything else is really, really good for Justin Verlander still. Oh, and he's 40 years old. Duh. And the velocity was there on that pitch. And yeah, yeah I, mean, I I think that because he was the number one pitcher in five by five leagues yes. last year. So you know, led, led the majors in the RA, led the majors in whip. Um, it's a little jarring to see somebody who did all that rank this low the following year, especially when it's somebody with the track record, Justin Verlander has, but you know, I, I think he's being downgraded because he's got to be 40 and, um, you know, maybe to a smaller degree because of some of those underlying stats, the swinging strike rate, the spin rate on the fastball, as you point out, Frank, uh, but I think, you know, the fact that Scherzer is also being downgraded as much as he is, I, I think it's mostly an age thing. And so I want to take the opportunity to make this point that at starting pitcher, I think age, while a risk factor ranks awfully low among the risk factors at this position specifically. Hitters, it's a different story. But there uh, and- is so much that can go wrong for a pitcher that just getting old like I said, you survive. Right. Like that's, it- that's, that's <laughs> like, that's, I've, I've used the analogy before, but there's this idea of the great filter uh, in, in astrophysics that explains what, perhaps why we haven't been contacted by alien life. And it's the idea that at some point in species development, there are filters that filter out most species. That's how pitching is like most young starting pitchers don't end up continuing to be starting pitchers. Most of them don't make the majors. There's your first filter. Then there's the ones who can't hack it as a starter. There's your next filter. Then there's the guys who can hack it as a starter skill-wise, but can't hold up physically. That's your next one. Max Scherzer, Justin Verlander, Jacob, Jacob Grom, less so, you know. But yeah. the other two guys, they've, they've passed all those filters, and that doesn't mean that they will continue to because – Throwing a baseball the way they do a hundred times every five days is an incredibly violent and unnatural thing to do to your shoulder and your elbow and your arm. And it's going to end poorly at some point for everyone. Like it's just, you can't do that your whole life, but those guys are the only ones who have really proven it. You know, Garrett Cole yep. also. And that counts it a lot for me at a position that's so volatile. Yes. All right, fair enough. Dylan Cease, I mentioned his name as well, uh, going just after these guys broke out last year in a big way, 227 strikeouts, fifth most in baseball. How did he do it? He has one of the best sliders in baseball, and he really leaned into it. He threw it a lot more, 43% usage last season, and he did a much better job limiting hard contact. Now, the things that concern me, the walks are still a major issue. 3.8 walks per nine for Dylan Cease. What happened in the second half? Because... He still had a 2.27 ERA, but his K per nine went from like 13 in the first half to 8.7. His swinging strike rate oh, went from 16. I didn't point, that. His six his swinging strike rate went from 16.4 percent in the first half to 13 percent, which is still a really good mark, but it's a big drop, you know, from one half yeah. of the season to the next. So there is I couldn't find anything, Chris, that stood out. Not really a good explanation. That's the yeah. weird thing. Like, yeah, he weird. was still throwing his slider a bunch, arguably threw it more in the second half of the season than he did the first half of the season. Still getting, you know, still spinning that thing like crazy. 2,800 RPMs in, in September with the slider. 
I don't really know what the explanation is, but like if there's a pitcher that we've talked about so far that is going to just flame out, just not not get hurt, because I think other pitchers are more likely to get hurt, but just not be good. I think yeah. Dylan Cease is by far the most likely of the ones we've talked about because he basically went from really, really bad quality of contact metrics to arguably the best of any starting pitcher in baseball last season. And that's basically the only difference. Like his strikeout rate was actually down a little bit from 2021 overall, his walk rate actually up a little bit, but he was a much better pitcher deservedly. So because he did a great job of limiting quality of contact, that's a stat. And that's a metric that is not particularly sticky from year to year for starting pitchers. And I think there's a lot of risk. Uh, That being said, I, I, I rank him roughly in this range. He's SP 15 for me. So I'm a little lower on him than ADP unlikely to draft Dylan Cease. I think there's a lot of risk here, but it's, I can certainly understand the appeal. It's, you know, the, the fact he led the majors in walks, that's always going to be a, a, a risky thing. Like if, like, when you have stuff as good as he does, you're as good as missing bats as he does. You, the number one way you're going to get beaten is by beating yourself. And walks are just inviting that to happen. I don't know, you know, again, barring injury, I don't know that the bottom out risk for Cease is worse than him reverting to his 2021 numbers where he had a 391 ERA, a 125 win. Sure, that's those what are, I mean. Yeah, I mean, those are higher than you'd like, but he's such a strikeout artist that you can live with them. And so that's, that's kind of what I think the downside is, but I think he's very likely to meet that downside. And I will point out, because I love pointing this out for Dylan Cease, that while he had a 229 ERA last year, a good reason, a big reason why is a 14 start stretch from May into August where he had a 0.66 ERA. He allowed six earned runs during that 14 start yeah, stretch. That's... He allowed 10 unearned runs, which are technically unearned, but you're giving up that many. Yeah, it's a little fluky. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a good thing to keep in mind. And I wrote him up as a bust too. Uh, his ADP right now is 39. I'm in a slow draft over at the NFBC right now, and he lasted to pick 57. And I drafted him because yeah, that's fine. That's like 20 picks past his ADP. And then at that point, I, I think he's worth the risk. He went after. Julio Reyes and I think Luis Castillo. So I, sure. I like pairing Cease and Freed. It's possible and they yep. they kind of balance out each other's strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, no, I, I think that's totally fine. Two more pitchers here uh, that we need to talk to about. Uh, talk about Max Scherzer at 40.8 ADP and Carl Sordon at 41.6. Scott, to your point, we've made it this far. And these are the two pitchers that are likely left based on draft position. They're probably the two pitchers I'm most likely to draft just because I think that they're all kind of in the same mix with other starting pitchers. Now, you can argue, obviously, Scherzer has done it for a lot longer than Carlos Rodon has, but Carlos Rodon, he maintained that big velocity jump from 2021. And for two years in a row now, he's looked like one of the top five or 10 starting pitchers on a skill set basis in all of baseball. So if these are the last two remaining from this group, I'll be totally fine just taking whichever one lasts. So I, I find myself drafting a lot of Scherzer and Carlos Rodon. What about you? And even last year, Carlos Rodon had a bit of an, uh, a velocity fluctuation late, right? And that just it didn't impact his production at all. To my um, knowledge, it was never as bad as it was the year before. Yeah. Like no, it end. wasn't. Yeah. But there was some, and I know you were freaking out about it, and, <laughs> and it just kept dominating. And I do that. I, 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 I like that that you can see a guy doesn't have to hold his premium velocity to be as effective as this. It's a rare quality, but it seems like a quality Rodon has. And what's wild about it is he's a fastball pitcher. I mean, he he throws that thing like 60, 70% of the time, even though he has a really, really good slider. So it's like, the fact that he was able to sustain that production despite some fluctuation in in velocity is very impressive, seeing as he is one of, if not the most fastball-heavy pitchers in baseball when you account for the fact that he just has one fastball. He's not like 
Lance Lynn throwing in cutters and, and two seamers. Like he's, he's just blowing four seamers by guys. Yeah. And I think some people might point to the fact that, okay, he's a fly ball pitcher. He's moving to Yankee stadium. He's a left-handed pitcher. And if you're going to get hurt by fly balls in Yankee stadium, it's going to come against left-handed batters. Well, guess what? Uh, Carl Serran is amazing against left-handed batters. So I don't, yeah. I don't really worry about that much. If you, if you look at left field, it's actually more spacious in Yankee Stadium, and it's tougher for right-handed batters to hit home runs. So that's just something I don't really worry about. You can bring up the health issues, but the ballpark is not one that worries me for Carlos Rodon. And, and then on Scherzer, if I could real quick yep. here, um, as I brought up earlier, you know, some people might look at his year-by-year -year inning breakdown. Oh, he hasn't thrown even 180 innings since 2018. True, but first of all, nobody had a chance to in 2020. So let's not hold that against him. Although he probably Se wouldn't have. He had injuries that year. Secondly, um, his injuries, I think he made 12 starts. His okay. injuries have not been arm related. It's been back stuff, neck stuff, uh, that sort of thing. Oblique, yeah. Oblique was last year. You're right. So, you know, it's not a sign of his arm breaking down. During that stretch where he hasn't got 280 innings, still a 271 ERA, 0.99 whip, 11.9K per nine. And this is the most important point. Last year, of the 23 starts Max Scherzer made, 19 of them were six innings or more. Uh, the shortest start he had last year was five innings. So on a start-by-start -start basis, he's still giving you that ace volume. And as much as we focus on year-long innings totals, myself included, what matters more is what they're doing on a start-by-start -start basis. Because you can find a fill-in for the starts that they're absent and still get, you know, okay production, especially with the pitching environment being what it is now. But you want the starts that they do give you to be impactful. And in Scherzer's case, they absolutely are. Chris, I feel like a theme for today's podcast has been all right, you'll find some pitchers that either give you volume or you'll find ones that give you really, really interesting skills and strikeouts, right? I found this stat. Only two pitchers last year with a K-minus walk rate over 26%, swinging strike rate over 14%, and average over six innings per start. Garrett Cole and Max Scherzer. Those are the only two. So I know the ERA, okay, but in terms of strikeouts and innings pitched, those are basically the two. Those are, It's Garrett Cole and Max Scherzer. So I... If you're giving me Scherzer at the end of the third or early early fourth round, I'm going to do it every single time. Yep. He's one of the handful of guys I have ranked a decent amount ahead of his ADP. He's SP5 for me. I Actually, both these guys are above their ADP for me. I have Scherzer at SP5, Rodon at SP6. I just – I think Rodon is – what Spencer Strider and Shane McClanahan are, except he doesn't have as much of an injury concern for me, or at least an innings concern for me. He has plenty of injury concern. His career has been dominated by an inability to stay healthy. But of those three, he's the only one who got close to 180 innings last season. Shane McClanahan had the shoulder issue last year that Rodon had in 2021. So I'll give the edge to Rodon there. I think those three guys in terms of talent are, you know, arguably three of the five best pitchers in baseball. And so Radon, I, I think, carries significant risk, but he's closer to the standard pitcher risk at this point for me than he certainly was a year ago, having made it through. Doesn't mean he'll do it again, but, you know, I, I, I have fewer concerns about Radon having seen him remain one healthy and two incredibly effective last season. I, I think he is just so, so good. I'm, a, I'm such a big fan. All right, let's wrap up with four more starting pitchers going between picks 49 and 53, and that'll get us through 18 starting pitchers today. Julio Rios at 49.4, Shane Bieber at 49.6, Zach Wheeler at 52.6, and Alec Manoa at 53.4. Uh, Julio Rios. Man, he got even better last season, and he has 37 wins over the past two seasons. That's the most in Major League Baseball, and I know wins are fluky, but I mean, when you pitch for the Dodgers and you typically go eh, around six, he doesn't go much more than six innings often, you're you're probably going to be in a pretty good position to get wins. So that is Julio Arias. Uh, Shane Bieber uh, bounced back last year. Awesome. He's a new Shane Bieber, though. His fastball velocity continues to drop. Uh, he mixed in a curveball more last year, and his cutter 
and the control was awesome, and he's got to continue with that if he wants to maintain uh, being this good. Zach Wheeler, he um, he was dealing with a shoulder injury during spring training and then returned, and he was awesome. Once again, 2A, 2 ERA, 104 whip. Uh, so the strikeouts were down a little bit. I, I still kind of like the value a lot on Zach Wheeler. Alec Manoa is the one that I kind of struggle with the most because he had the awesome ratios, throws a ton of quality starts. He had 25 quality starts. It's insane. But the FIP, the XFIP, the Sierra, the XERA, it was all significantly higher. We're talking like a run or a run and a half higher than his actual ERA. So just a lack of a track record. I don't know how much I can trust it. Uh, Scott, lots of names here, but is there anyone mm -hmm. that you find yourself gravitating towards? Manoa, Wheeler, Bieber, and Arias. I mean, I'd like them all. I'd take any of them as my number one. Um, just a few quick points here. Arias, it really says something about the state of pitching as a whole that Arias went from being the eighth highest drafted last year to the 16th highest drafted this year, even though basically all of his numbers improved. He does feel a little bit boring, very safe for ERA and wins. Uh, going to fall a little short of the true aces and strikeouts, but that's fine. I kind of put he, him and Max Fried in the same category. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised Fried isn't higher as a result, or maybe Urias should be lower. I don't know. Uh, Bieber and Manoa, I think, statistically speaking, are also very similar. Unless Bieber experiences an unexpected return of velocity. Um then they're both probably going to be a little underwhelming for strikeouts relative to this group, but they both have kind of sneaky ways of, of keeping their ERA low. In Manoa's case, it's a high fly ball rate, which is actually a good thing. And, and they're both capable of taking on a lot of volume. Bieber's proven it time and time again, except for the year he got injured. He goes over 200 innings again last year. And Alec Manoa, his starts for being somebody so young. And, of course, he's big-bodied and everything. So um, that helps. He goes very deep into games. And so I, I kind of like I was saying, Arias and Max Fried, I rank similarly. It's, it's hard for me to separate Bieber and Alec Manoa for the same reasons. The one I probably like most, if you're forcing me to pick a singular pitcher, is Zach Wheeler. Zach Wheeler, I think, has the best chance of this group to uh, perform like one of the previous groups, maybe even as good as uh, like that Aaron Nola, Brandon Woodruff range of starting pitchers. Cause we've certainly seen it from him before just two years ago. And uh, remember he got, got off to a slow start last year because of a shoulder issue that delayed his spring training held down his numbers for a little while. But for most of the year, he was that Zach Wheeler still the, the true ace version. And so I still see him in that light, even though ADP has him a little lower. Yeah, and if you count his postseason uh, starts that he had as well, he got up to 188 and two-thirds innings last season for Zach Wheeler. So when he's on the mound, the guy is still a horse. Uh, Chris, do you find yourself gravitating or maybe avoiding anyone purposely in this group? I wouldn't say gravitating to or avoiding any. I, I Manoa, you know, one thing that you guys mentioned, he's a fly ball pitcher. He's also very good at quality of contact suppression, um, which is you know has helped him outperform peripherals and he's the guy like if you're if you're thinking about someone who i don't want to say take a leap because he's probably not going to have an improvement on his 224 era from last yeah. year but like he could get back to being the strikeout pitcher he was as a rookie and if he does that while sustaining you know the innings jump and everything else i mean he could be a legitimate ace alec manoa so i, I like him quite a bit i like zach wheeler quite a bit Bieber, I think I drafted in a head-to-head -head points league because he remains a standout in that format as well um, that we did recently. Arias, I agree that like Arias and Max Fried are kind of the Spider-Man meme, and then like Alec Manoa is kind of a slightly larger Spider-Man off to the side pointing at them. Um, He's better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, or like if you watched Into the Spider-Verse, like the Jake Johnson version's got a little bit of a, you know, with, hey, <laughs> okay. big beefy baseball boy. I love him. Uh, yep. He probably has a little more upside than Arias or uh, Freed. I like all three of them just because it's sort of the case for Sandy Alcantara the past couple of seasons before he took a big leap forward, where if nothing else improves, all three of those guys are going to be safe bets for ERA and whip and, and just pitching pretty well because of that quality of contact suppression. But 
if they take a step forward, you know, the way Alcantara did with his control, then there's room for them to grow. And, and I, I think Manoa probably has a little more room to grow of that group, but I, I think all of them are, are perfectly fine at their prices. All right. Well, we went a little bit long on this one, but you know, there's a lot of pictures to talk about. So we'll be here for the next two days talking about a whole bunch more. We're going to wrap there for Scott and Chris. I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching fantasy baseball today. We'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.